about this PhD defense, it's always to me, uh, PhD defense is just the pinnacle of, uh, of the academic life and this will be no exception. Zach grew up in Georgia and did his undergraduate work uh, at Georgia Tech in biology, then did a master's degree at the University of Cincinnati before coming to uh, MSU and the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics. Um, this is especially exciting for Zach to defend because it's been a very long haul. And it's been a long haul, not because Zach has been slow, but I think as you will see and have probably seen evidence of before, he does things very big. And uh, I think many of you have seen that evidence in the pictures of the Petri dishes, uh, where I think he did certainly the biggest mutational screen I've ever heard of that involved 40 trillion cells and uh, tens of thousands of Petri dishes. Uh, after that, and you will hear about it, he, for a single uh, study looking at the evolutionary changes he'll describe, involved sequencing several dozen genomes in their entirety and analyzing them. And then most recently, um, Zach was preparing an introductory chapter for his thesis. And he told me he was having a little bit of writer's block uh, over the last month. And so I was kind of expecting, okay, we'll get something that's a five to ten page highlight uh, of uh, kind of the broad intellectual themes he's going to talk about. So a little over a week ago, up shows a 70 page introductory <laughs> chapter with over 200 references, many of them book length, covering everything from microevolutionary studies to paleontology and history to philosophy and literature. And so I think that's a perfect indication of the way Zach thinks and works. And uh, without further ado, I'll let Zachary tell you all about the interesting work that he's been doing. You should, uh, Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. Had I known I was going to get one like that, I would have done this a while ago. <laughs> so, one of my favorite jokes goes like this. It was a man once who was convinced he could fly, and to prove it to himself, he jumped off a tall building. On the way down, as he passed the windows, the people inside the building heard him repeating the same thing over and over again. So far, so good. So far, so good. <laughs> I've been struck by kind of a profound uncertainty in that joke because it ends there. You don't know what happens. Does he go splat, as indicated, or does he fly? You don't know because the joke ends there. And it's also struck me over the past several years how much like graduate school that joke is. You don't know if you can do it, so you just don't. And the nice thing about today is I get to find out the end. Do I go splat or do I fly? That's up to the gentleman of my committee. So. Uh, I guess for now, so far so good, and let's get started. <laughs> so, Julius Caesar, who died 2,055 years ago yesterday, um, once wrote, But fortune, which has great power in all matters, causes great shifts in human affairs with just a little disturbance. By way of illustration, during the Civil War, the chances for uh, a southern victory was dependent upon winning recognition by foreign powers as an independent nation, and also crushing the willingness of the U.S. to fight in military victories. So this depended on battlefield victories as well as successful application of economic pressure on the British, who needed southern cotton to run their textile industry. In the fall of 1862, it looked like southern victory and foreign recognition were in sight. Robert E. Lee had uh, spectacularly repelled a large uh, Union offensive that almost took the southern capital of Richmond, and then launched his own northern Virginia offensive in which he defeated the Union Army multiple times, culminating in a tremendously lopsided southern victory at the Second Battle of Bull Run. Across the Atlantic, the British were suffering through what they called the Cotton Famine. The loss of co uh, southern cotton had shuttered their textile mills and thrown thousands and thousands of workers out into the streets where they were suffering horrible deprivations and starvation. The British government was getting close to recognizing the Confederacy and giving military aid to alleviate these economic problems. Knowing this, and hoping to further destroy U.S. morale uh, in the lead up to congressional elections, Lee led an invasion force of 55,000 into Maryland, hoping to stir up problems and humiliate the Union. The Union Army at the time was led by George McClellan, who was an incredibly cautious general, and although he had 87,000 men under his command, 
he was convinced that he just could not go out and challenge Lee because he was sure Lee had 120,000 men. In. That's true. 87 is not enough to challenge 120,000. He wasn't going to do it until he got warm. Lee, on the other hand, was not so cautious. He was a very bold general, <laughs> and knowing McClellan's sluggishness, he decided that it was safe to strike simultaneously at both Hagerstown, Maryland, and take the Union arsenal at Harper's Ferry. So on September 9th, he issued Special Order 191 which he ordered the division of the Army of Northern Virginia into four parts, and then specified the routes they were to take and the targets they were to attack. On the morning of September 13th, the Union Army slowly, ponderously moved into Frederick, Maryland, cold on the heels of the Southern Army. And at 10 a.m., the uh, 27th Indiana Infantry Regiment stopped in the field outside of town for a rest and breakfast. Corporal Barton Mitchell, and a friend of his found a tree at the edge of a meadow at which to boil their coffee and have their breakfast. And while there, he stretched out onto the tree, relaxed, and happened to look over to some tall grass nearby where he noted an envelope. In this envelope, he found three cigars wrapped in a piece of paper. And while his friend went to go get some matches because they didn't have any, Mitchell glanced at the piece of paper and found that it was an official document of the Confederate Army. One that read Special Order 191. <laughs> Glancing through it, he realized its significance, got it to his commanding officer, and it wound its way up to General McClellan, who, now knowing that Lee had divided his army and where it was going and everything, finally spurred himself to action and started launching attacks. This culminated in the Battle of Antietam on September 17th. 22,000 men either died or were severely injured in this fight. It was the bloodiest day in American history. It was seen at the time as a great Union victory in the U.S., in the Confederacy, and abroad. Lee abandoned his invasion and slumped back to Virginia, and Northern morale was boosted, and the Republicans continued to hold Congress and continue the war effort in the fall. Lincoln used the occasion of the victory to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves in the Confederate territory, and changed the moral character of the war from merely preservation of the Union to also um, uh, an end to slavery. This resulted in a great upwelling of popular support for the Union in Britain, making it politically untenable for the British government to recognize or aid the Confederacy, and this effectively ended the prospects of the South getting foreign recognition. They were never so close to victory again. The course of American history that led to today, that led to me here talking to all you Yankee scum up here. <laughs> dropping of an envelope where a man happened to rest and where he happened to glance. Of all the ways the world could be, one of these the world is. And it is the way it is because of how history with all of its attendant coincidences, happenstances, and utter freak occurrences occurred. In history, details matter a great deal. History, of course, is rife with instances like this. The nation of Bulgaria owes its origin greatly to a matter of clumsiness and a gabby foot. World War I's origins can be traced back to the injudicious use of a pair of forceps and a breech berth. The Russian Empire, all its attendant consequences on the 20th century, was brought down by a single nucleotide mutation. We can trace things like this in our own lives, where little happenstances shaped who we are in our paths in life. These are the things that underlie the power of speculations of what might have been and underlie the power of what Harry Turtledove has called those two mournful little words, what if. They reflect something called contingency, that property of history whereby historical outcomes are causally dependent upon the precise characteristics of very long and probable chains of, cause of antecedent events, small changes in which could have had massive ramifications over the course of history. This definition is drawn from the writings of this man, Stephen Jay Gould, very much a student of history as well as of life, as one of the greatest evolutionary biologists of the late 20th century. And he pointed out, evolution is inherently historical. After all, whatever else may be true of every living thing upon this earth, there is this. They are all part of historically continuous lineages stretching back unbroken three and a half billion years or more to the last common ancestor in the progeno before it. Future evolution is altered, constrained, and potentiated by this past mass of evolutionary history. 
Moreover, adaptation is to a changeable environment, and the environment indeed can change so rapidly that organisms cannot adapt to it, with the result that mass extinction events take place, and the future evolution has to be based on those lineages that happen to survive. As a consequence, Gould asserted, evolutionary outcomes are fundamentally contingent upon the exact details of their evolutionary histories. Evolutionary outcomes are unpredictable. And, he said, if one were to replay the tape of life from various places in the distant past, the result today would be a far different living world than the one of which we are a part of the survey around us. Others, of course, disagree. Richard Dawkins and Simon Conway Morris have pointed out that certain ecological patterns and biological challenges seem to always emerge from the interplay of organisms and their environments. Natural selection is then robust enough to find similar adaptations and outcomes regardless of the exigencies and vagaries of history. Moreover, viable evolutionary destinations and outcomes are limited, and as evidence, they point to the many examples of convergent evolution in the world, such as camera eyes and echolocation, sociality, endothermy, the list can go on and on. As a result, they point out, evolution is broadly repeatable. Were one to replay the tape of life, one might notice significant differences, but replay it many times, and one would be struck far more by the similarities amidst the minor differences. The reality is, though, evolution involves both an interplay between um, historical contingency and deterministic processes such as natural selection. And the reality is between the two extremes of radical contingency and radical convergence. So what's needed, really, is empirical study into the role of contingency and chance in evolution. And there are a great many studies that have begun to do this over the past 20 years. Unfortunately, of course, Gould's great thought experiment of replaying the tape of life is not possible on the planetary scale he envisioned, at least not in the current time. Uh, who knows about the future? But it can be done on a smaller scale, including through the use of uh, evolution experiments using microorganisms like the E. coli long-term evolution experiment, or LTEE, which Dr. Linsky began on February 24th of 1988, when he founded 12 populations of E. coli B from a single clone. Ever since, with some exceptions, every 24 hours, 1% of these populations has been transferred to a fresh minimal glucose medium, BM25, in which they attain a daily average maximum of 300 to 500 million cells. Under these conditions, the populations experience 6.64 generations of evolution a day, or thereabouts. And at this pace, over the 23 years so far of the experiment, the populations have experienced more than 52,000 generations of evolution. Over the entire course of this, every 500 generations, viable samples of each population have been frozen constituting a complete, viable, frozen fossil record of the entire evolutionary sequence of each population, from which, at any time we please, we may take out ancestral, intermediate, and evolved forms to directly compare them and determine how evolution has proceeded. All the populations started out genetically identical, save for a single nucleotide polymorphism present in six of the populations that conferred a neutral genetic marker that allowed cross-contamination detection, as well as some other nifty things I won't go into. Um, we've held the environment constant and stable. There are no asteroid strikes so far. No vast climatological changes, no mass extinctions. The ancestor was completely clonal, so no sex was there to start out with. Who knows what's evolved since? Uh, I know it, we've never detected any. There is no intergenetic recombination. There is no gene flow. Each population is an island, a planet unto itself. Um, and thus, all evolution in the experiment has been purely by natural selection and drift, acting upon de novo mutation from the original genome. As a consequence, the experiment <laughs> is very much playing the same tape from the same point under the same conditions 12 times simultaneously and doing so under conditions in which only the core processes of evolution are operative. Despite these stringent conditions, contingency can still affect the evolution of these populations because it arises from the very core processes of evolution. After all, heritable variation ultimately arises 
uh, by random mutation, in which the order of mutations is not determined. It's a matter of history and chance. Moreover, the different populations can fix functionally equivalent mutations that, though similar in their function, um, are very much different in their details, and that can have significant consequences. The populations also accumulate their own divergent suites of neutral mutations. Consequently, the different populations experience different mutational histories that yield different genetic backgrounds with different epistatic and pleiotropic characteristics that then determine the fitness and range of possible mutations thereafter that thereby determine the range of possible evolutionary trajectories and outcomes. So this then opens the possibility for divergence between the populations, at least in part based on the evolution of different contingent adaptations. What is a historically contingent adaptation, though? Well, it's an adaptation that requires a particular history to evolve. And it would be complex in origin, requiring multiple steps, some of which would be probably unrewarded. As a consequence, it would not be rapidly evolved by cumulative selection and would be fundamentally a historical byproduct of evolution. <clears throat> contingent adaptation should be distinguished by two properties. First, they should be unique. More or less unique. <coughs> Independent recurrences should be rare because the needed history will rarely recur. Second, they should take longer to evolve. Indeed, the paleontologist Michael Foote has pointed out that contingency may be implied by a long lag between the presentation of an ecological opportunity and the evolution of a trait that allows its exploitation. As it happens, there is just such an opportunity that was present through after duration of the LTEE. This is because the minimal glucose median DM25 in which the populations are maintained contains not only 139 micromolar glucose, but also 1,700 micromolar citrate. This is included as a chelating agent to help the bacteria take up iron. The large amount is really an accident of history that I won't go into, but if you're interested, I can talk your ear off later. Um, literally. Um, <laughs> It also constitutes a potential second carbon source, and I stress the word potential, because a lack of aerobic citrate utilization, or a CIP minus phenotype, is a major diagnostic characteristic of E. coli as a species that's been very important in medical settings for doing things like differentiating E. coli from salmonella. But E. coli is not inert towards citrate. It has a ferric dicitrate iron acquisition system, though in this, citrate does not enter the cell. It has a complete TCA cycle, so it does metabolize citrate in the course of growing aerobically on other substrates, and most E. coli can ferment citrate. So it looks like the barrier to the CIP plus or aerobic citrate using phenotype in E. coli is the lack of an appropriate citrate transporter expressed when oxygen is present, even though clearly there is one called CIT-T that's expressed when oxygen is absent. And this is what allows citrate fermentation. So it seemed to be a very easy barrier to jump. Just activate that gene. should be easy. It's not. Spontaneous CIP plus mutants of E. coli are extraordinarily rare. Only one was reported in the entire 20th century, despite all the work that was done on E. coli and media containing citrate. Despite this, when Dr. Linsky started the experiment, there was some expectation of, there's so much food there, they'll figure out how to use it somehow. Well, years passed, Soviet Union fell, presidents came and went, dance fans came and went, and so on. <laughs> the citrate remained untouched, and basically he gave up hope, but they won't do it. Then, 16 years in, in early 2003, something nifty happened. One population, called Air Minus Three, underwent a sudden and dramatic tenfold expansion that was, it was dramatic enough, you can, I don't know how well you can tell, but that is much cloudier than the regular ones that you really have to squint to see that they're cloudy at all. It was remarkable. This was found to be due to the spontaneous evolution of a set plus variant within the Era minus population. It had a slew of markers and mutations that we knew were particular to the populations and to this population in particular. It is not a contaminant. These CIP plus clones are very uh, much distinguished in their growth in DM25 from their CIP minus brethren, which have a single rapid phase of growth on glucose. CIP plus, on the other hand, will have a fast, uh, short phase of growth on glucose.
glucose, exhaust the glucose, and start a longer, slower, more complex phase of growth on citrate. Looking into the population, interestingly enough, the CIP plus variants were present in the population as a small minority as early as generation 31,500. We didn't notice them because the early CIP plus clones were very, very poor at using citrate. They couldn't get growing on it very well during the course of 24 hours. So, the trait ended up being refined over the course of about 1,500 generations prior to its between its evolution and the population expansion. <coughs> when it did rise to numerical dominance, though, it did not sweep the population. Instead, a SIP minus subpopulation persisted as a small minority, at least through generation 40,000, <coughs> indicating that the evolution of SIP plus might in fact be a speciation event. Uh, this uh, persistence appears to be based on a frequency-dependent relationship uh, that revolves around CIP minus cross-feeding on substances excreted by CIP plus while growing on citrate. And this is work done by uh, Caroline Turner with assistance from Daniel Mitchell. And I'm sure you'll be hearing a great deal more about their wonderful work in the years to come, so stay tuned for that. Um, but one of the big questions that came from CIP plus is this. How is it that CIPLOS took so long to evolve and did so in only 1 in 12 populations, even though they were evolved under the same conditions with the citrate there the entire time? Well, certainly, the unique and long-delayed evolution of CIPLOS and Arrow minus 3 fits the expectations that I put forth for a contingent trait. So it's perfectly reasonable to pose a historical contingency hypothesis, which would hold that the evolution of CIPLOS required multiple mutations. Say, for instance, it needed four mutations. You get one, no CIP plus. Two, no CIP plus. Three, no. You have to have all four in order to get that uh, CIP plus trait. Because cumulative selection could not facilitate the accumulation of this, because evolution has no foresight, it had no idea it was proceeding towards CIP plus. This was an accident. This was an incidental byproduct of the history of the population. And in fact, it evolved in SIP minus under this hypothesis because it happened to accumulate one or more of the needed mutations over the course of its history. So after all, once you have A and B and C, all you need to do is D. So once you have a few of those, it potentiates the evolution of the trait. But at the same time, that uniqueness and long delay is also consistent with an alternative hypothesis of rare mutation under which the switch to CIP plus was caused by a single, very rare mutation of very large effect that was really background insensitive. So it could cause um, the phenotype to occur in any background in which it could occur. And this background, crucially, was not a product of the history <coughs> during the experiment. So because of the structure of the LTE, I can take a Gouldian approach to testing these two hypotheses. Because I can go into that frozen fossil record of Arrow minus 3 and refound the population with samples that were uh, frozen at different time points, replay evolution, and look at the pattern of re evolution of the CIP plus trait. Under these conditions, the two hypotheses make very distinct and different uh, predictions. The historical contingency hypothesis predicts that it should become easier to evolve CIP plus after the population becomes potentiated. So, there should be more re-evolution events that occur in replays founded from time points at later into the evolutionary history. Because after all, if an outcome is crucially dependent upon a prior event, after that event takes place, the outcome should be more likely. <coughs> Alternately, <coughs> excuse me, the rare mutation hypothesis would predict that all generations should have approximately the same capacity to re-evolve CIP+. Plus. And as such, re-evolution events should not be temporally skewed, but should be randomly distributed across the timeline uh, that we sample from. So I replayed the tape of Arrow minus 3's evolution three times using two different approaches. The first was the elegant way that I followed in the first contingent experiment, contingency experiment. And in it, I refounded Arrow minus 3 with set minus clones isolated from 12 time points in the fossil record proceeding from generation 0 through 32,500. And I then took six clones from each of these time points for a total of 72 total populations. 
and then evolved them in DM25 under the ancestral conditions under which the trait originally evolved. <coughs> this experiment ran for 3,700 generations, just a little over two years. It was begun on May 20th of 2005, which was the third anniversary of Gould's death. And it ended on September 10th of 2007, which would have been his 66th birthday. It was kind of his memorial experiment. <laughs> Over the course of the experiment, I observed four instances of SIP plus re-evolution, all of which occurred in replay populations that were founded with clones from later generations. So it's looking good for our contingency. The second approach is really the brute force way. And it involved spreading huge amounts of, plate of cells on minimal citrate or MC plates and then looking for rare SIP plus mutant colonies that would be the only things that could grow on there. This way I could look at more cells of more clones faster and I could have longer incubation times to catch very slow growing mutants and also find potentially some starvation induced mutants. It was a way of doing hyper fast, hyper parallel, hyper large pre-evolution experiments. I did this in two experiments. The first one, the second contingency experiment, was really a proof of concept. I took the 68 different clones that I used in the first contingency experiment. I grew up five replicates of each in DM500, which has 20 times the amount of glucose as DM25 in order to get more cells. I plated them on MC plates and incubated for three to five weeks. And over the course of the experiment, out of 130 billion cells put down, I observed six total mutants. These arose in five <coughs> independent replicates that were founded from four different parent clones, all of which from late, were from later generations. So feeling good, I decided to scale up. And I tested 14 time points in the third contingency experiment, including some different times so I could try to track down when uh, potentiation came into being. And then I isolated 20 clones from each time point, with the ancestor tested 20 times for time zero. So I had 261 clones total. I grew up 10 replicates of each in DM1000 or DM2000 to get even more cells. And in total, I plated 40.4 trillion cells among 2,800 replicates. And over the course of this experiment, which took about five months, I think, I observed five independent, or sorry, eight independent instances of re-evolution of SIP+. There are a total of 429 mutant colonies out of those 40 trillion put down, <coughs> or a maximum of 137 per replicate, um, arising from seven different parent clones, all of which were isolated from generations 20,000 and later. No SIP plus mutants were observed among any of the 200 replicates of the ancestor that were plated. So, just on cursory examination, it looks like there is definitely a greater tendency for later generation clones to yield SIP plus mutants across all experiments. To look at this statistically, uh, Dr. Linsky did this. He analyzed the experiments using Monte Carlo resampling tests in which, for each experiment that were compared, the observed mean generation of clones yielding SIP plus against the mean expected under the rare mutation hypothesis that the same probability of using of uh, uh, producing SIP plus mutants should occur across all generations. So it's done with one million iterations of shuffling without replacement, and it yielded um, a highly significant p-value for experiment one, very highly significant p-value for experiment two, and uh, a marginally significant outcome for experiment three, which was rather irksome given its size, but it was designed to be the nail in the coffin. <laughs> but oh well. So combining these probabilities from all three experiments using Whitlock's Z-transformation method, whether weighted or unweighted by the number of mutants occurring in each experiment, yielded very highly significant p-values that allowed the uh, definitive rejection of the rare mutation hypothesis in favor of the contingency hypothesis. And for holding that the SIP plus trait was historically contingent upon one or more mutations that occurred prior to generation 20,000 and potentiated the trait's uh, eventual evolution. So potentiation seems to have something to do with increasing the rate at which SIP plus mutants occur. And to determine the magnitude of this potentiation effect, I undertook some Luria Delbrook fluctuation tests in which I compared the rate of mutation to SIP plus in the ancestor 
to that of putative potentiated clones, which were essentially SIP minus parent clones that had yielded SIP plus <coughs> over the course of one or more of the three experiments. I found that the rate of mutation of SIP plus in the ancestor was approximately never. The upper bound uh, is somewhere on the order of 1 per 10 trillion. The reality is probably much, much lower. Out of almost 10 trillion ancestral cells put down, no mutants were ever observed. In the potentiated background, it's a bit better. It's approximately almost never. Uh, with a, an estimated rate of about 1 per trillion. Still very low, but sufficient to make the trait mutationally accessible. <coughs> Interestingly, comparing the single nucleotide mutation rate in these two backgrounds, it's approximately the same. And it's also, you'll notice, much higher. This is the typical mutation rate. This indicates, if nothing else, that potentiation is not a matter of general hypermutability. Instead, it appears to be particular to the rate of mutation of sub plus. So, shifting gears and summing up so far, sub plus evolution appears to have involved three distinct phases. The first was potentiation, during which a genetic background was constructed in which sub plus was mutationally accessible, followed by actualization, in which the phenotypic switch from sub minus to sub plus took place. And then a process of refinement, whereby there was an accumulation of mutations that improved the capacity of SIP plus variants to use the citrate resource under the conditions of the experiment. So what are the genetic changes involved in these phases? How do they work? What's the genetic history of the population? To answer these and other questions, Ender took an extensive program of whole genome resequencing using the Illumina platform. I obtained the complete genome sequences of 29 clones, both SIP plus and SIP minus, isolated uh, through various time points from early on up to 40,000. The resulting data totals about 5 terabytes, so if someone were to demand all of the data, in principle, it could be printed out. But this printout would weigh approximately as much as a Ticonderoga class guided missile cruiser, <laughs> like the USS Antietam. <laughs> Now, it's awesome to have this much data. I have no clue how to read it. I don't know binary or image files or any of that. So thankfully, we had Dr. Jeff Barrick in the lab as a postdoc, who honestly is one of the most incredibly brilliant. He's blushing. I thought I'm going to blush. Uh, most ungodly, brilliant human beings to ever walk the earth. And he developed his own bioinformatics analysis software including a group of data mining programs affectionately called GNOME, that converted this guided missile cruiser bolus of data into meaningful information by identifying all of the SNPs, deletions, IS insertions, duplications, and so on, in each of those genomes by comparing them to the complete genome sequence of the ancestor, which had been attained previously. This then permitted us to reconstruct the population's phylogenetic history, identify some of the mutations underlying SIP plus, and determine the traits mechanistic basis. The first step was reconstruction of the population's phylogeny. And Jeff did this to the state to come. <laughs> and he constructed presence, absence matrices of all identified mutations for all genomes, and then used this matrix to construct an initial parsimony-based tree in phyla and then determine branch lengths using a molecular clock based on mutation accumulation and then the maximum likelihood method. The resulting phylogeny showed that the population was much more heterogeneous over the course of its population than we had suspected. There was much more ecology going on in that population than we originally thought, which made Caroline very happy. Um, one of the major features is the population was made up for at least 10,000 generations prior to the evolution of SIP plus with three major clades that were interacting and coexisting that entire time. Very interesting. The SIP plus clones then form a coherent clade of their own within the third of these clades. So there was a single origin and they're all related to a common ancestor. Another interesting finding is that a mutator phenotype evolved in the SIP plus lineage shortly after the population expansion as a consequence of a mutation that caused a defect in the mute S gene and the mismatch repair pathway. This led to a much, much higher rate of mutation accumulation in the SIP plus lineage than in SIP minus. 
And uh, it also was further evidence of evolutionary independence between the SIP uh, plus lineage and at least one SIP minus lineage. So looking specifically at those SIP plus clones, all of them I found to have a tandem duplication or amplification of a 2933 base pair genetic segment that is not found in any SIP minus clones and overlaps the SIT citrate fermentation operon and includes the entire SIT-T gene, which encodes the citrate succinate anaporter that allows for citrate importation during citrate fermentation. These amplifications and duplications are present in tandem head-to-tail orientations, which means that SIT-T is placed under the control of the RNK promoter, forming a new RNK SIT-T regulatory module and because RNK is involved in aerobic metabolism, this suggests that the RNK promoter <coughs> supports expression of SIT-T during aerobic growth resulting in the SIT plus phenotype. So essentially the SIT duplication was a promoter capture event that co-opted the uh, RNK promoter for co-option of SIT-T for aerobic citrate transport. To test this, I looked at the question of whether or not the RNK sit t module is sufficient to cause a SIP plus phenotype when placed in the SIP minus background. And to do this, I placed an amplification junction carrying the SIT, sorry, the RNK promoter into the uh, sit g gene uh, in the genome of a potentiated clade 3 clone called uh, ZBB30. Uh, so this put the RNK promoter in that amplification junction upstream of SIT-T where it should control it. This resulted in an isogenic construct where the only difference between it and its parent clone was the presence of this reconstructed RNK SIT-T module. I then compared the isogenic construct to the parent clone. And I found that the isogenic construct uh, is SIT+, plus, albeit very, very poorly SIT+. Plus. It has a very long delay between the exhaustion of glucose and very poor sporadic abortive growth on citrate. So this indicates that certainly the RK sit t module is sufficient to cause the SIP plus phenotype, but only a very weak one. Indeed, it confers a fitness benefit of only about 1%, which is remarkable. However, this is consistent with the weakness of the early SIP plus uh, clones, if you'll recall. So, this brings us to refinement. What genetic changes underlie the, or underlay the evolution of SIP plus clones that had this kind of phenotype to this at 33,000 and allowed that uh, population expansion to take place? To find out, I examined the genomes of our SIP plus, uh, mutant, our SIP plus clone collection, focusing on those that were isolated from the population between 31,500 and the population expansion shortly after 33,000. And one thing stood out, and that was the improvement in the SIP plus phenotype was associated with an increase in the dosage of the RNK SIT T module as a consequence of increased copy number of the SIT amplification. And this suggests that that dosage increase was underlying the improved SIP plus phenotype. To test this, I cloned a complete RNK SIT T module into a high copy number plasmid, PUC19, then transformed this recombinant plasmid into that same SIP minus clone I used earlier, ZDB30, and then examined the growth of the transformant versus its parent, NDM25. And I found it's the uh, green one there that the transformant displays very strong growth on citrate. Its phenotype is very similar to SIP plus clones taken from the population at 33,000. So this indicates that this uh, dosage increase is sufficient to explain refinement of the SIP plus phenotype. Now, interestingly, looking back at tracking the number of modules per SIP plus genome, there's a relaxation event that takes place after uh, the population <coughs> And what this probably is consequent to is the fact that genetic amplifications collapse easy, easily. They're very unstable. They, high, they occur at high frequency, but they also collapse at high frequency. So probably what this indicates is that 
When CIP Plus was still poor at using citrate, it needed some way of becoming better, and its population was small, so it was dependent on these high-frequency, unstable mutations. But after the expansion and their population was large, they shifted to refinement based around more stable mutations like SNPs and deletions and such. And that's a subject for later studies. I won't go into it now. This brings us to potentiation, which is tricky for a number of reasons. For one thing, we don't know the number of mutations involved. Moreover, and more significantly, there's no known phenotype that's associated with it aside from an increase in the very low rate of mutation to CIP plus, which does not provide a basis of selection. So the first thing I did was try to localize the origin of potentiation within the population phylogeny and narrow down the number of mutations that I had to consider. And to do this, I tried to determine the distribution of the 13 putative potentiated clones identified over the course of the replay experiments within that tree. And to do this, I identified 10 different phylogenetically informative marker mutations and sequenced them in those 13 potentiated clones. And then went ahead and sequenced them in 256 other clones that were used in the replay experiments so I could find out the distribution of, or sorry, the level at which I sampled each of the different clades over the course of the experiments. What I found was I was able to definitively place 205 of the clones in the known clades. 16 went into this uh, little gray one down there. It was unsuccessful, so we call it unsuccessful clade. It's very creative. Um, the remaining 189 that were placed went into the three major clades with their distribution described here. You'll notice that most of them went into clade 2. It's able to uh, locate the placement of all but one of the potentiated clones, and they were distributed across all three of the clades, uh, with most of them being placed in clade three. This uh, distribution is highly non random and suggests that this over representation in clade three is real at a very highly significant level. What this suggests is that, in fact, potentiation involved at least two mutations, one of which occurred prior to the common ancestor of the three clades, and then one that was particular to clade three. So this didn't help a whole lot as far as narrowing things down. So I asked, how does potentiation work? There are two possible mechanisms. The first is functional epistasis, whereby the potentiating mutations interact with the actualized mutation, that SIP amplification, to produce the SIP plus phenotype. Alternately, it could be a matter of physical promotion, whereby the first potentiating, potentiating mutation causes the second one, which causes the actualized mutation. I had two tests of these two hypotheses. First, I looked at the background dependence of the effect of this RNK SIP T module. So, the two mechanisms make different predictions based on what the phenotypic effect of the module should be in a sit minus background. <clears throat> Functional epistasis would predict that the RNK sit T module should produce a weaker uh, sit plus phenotype in a non potentiated versus a potentiated background because the non potentiated won't have those mutations that make it effective. Whereas physical promotion would predict that it would produce just as strong a phenotype regardless of the background. To test this, I took that recombinant plasmid and I transformed it into the ancestor as well as clones from all three clades using ZDB30 again for clade 3, and then looked at the growth of the transformants in DM25. And I found that clearly, number one, the plasmid conferred a SIP plus phenotype in all of the backgrounds, but it was much, much stronger in clade 3. It was less consistent less strong in all of the other backgrounds. So this strongly suggests that epistatic interactions are at least partly responsible for the potentiation effect. Indeed, looking into clade 3 specific mutations, there's one good candidate. This is a single nucleotide polymorphism in a gene called ARCB, which is involved in the anoxic redox control system. And when it's damaged, this causes an upregulation in TCA cycle enzymes, which of course would seem to be very important to growing on citrate. And this is also a subject for future research. The second test involved looking at the range of SIP plus actualizing mutations 
in that collection of 19 independently evolved SIF plus mutants that I got out of the replay experiments. So the physical promotion hypothesis would predict that all of these different mutants would be due to recurrence of that same SIT duplication. Alternately, functional epistasis would make two possible predictions based on how it worked. If the epistatic interaction was at the level of improving expression from the RNK promoter, then uh, all of those different SIP plus actualizing mutations should be due to the recurrence of similar SIT amplifications because it would need to have SIT T placed under the RNK promoter's control. This would be uninformative because that prediction is identical to that for the physical promotion hypothesis, but if the epistatic effect occurred at another level physiologically, such as upregulation of the TCA cycle, then the SIP plus actualizing mutations could have a number of different variations so long as a citrate transporter was produced during aerobic growth. So I examined those 19 independent mutants, tried to identify their putative actualized mutations. I sequenced the complete genomes of six of them. And I found that all 19 have mutations affecting the CIT gene. There are a great variety of them too, they're not all the same. I've been able to more or less resolve 18 of these mutations, and most of them very clearly place CIT under the control of the new promoter, but not always the same one. Eight of the mutants uh, were due to a variant, a production of a variant of the original CIT duplication. In seven of them, there were reconstitutions and variations on the RNK CIT T module, though none of them have the same uh, uh, end boundaries, strangely enough. One of them, alternately, places CIT T under the control of RNA's promoter. And then six of the mutants have copies of insertion sequence three inserted into CIT G upstream of CIT T. And because IS3 carries strong constitutive outward directed promoters, this probably activates CIT T in these mutants. In two of the mutants, there were large duplications of part or all of the CIT operon. Uh, these were up to 14 kb, so they were quite large. And then one has a very large uh, chromosomal inversion, like almost a megabase, that places most of the CIT operon under the control of the promoter for a very distant fibrial regulation gene. One then has a deletion in CIT G that presumably creates a new promoter that hasn't been detected yet. So, Clearly, there were many alternate CIP plus actualizing mutations that were possible in a potentiated background. The only thing they have in common is apparently activation of the CIT-T transporter during aerobic growth. This then supports strongly the epistasis hypothesis of how potentiation works. And given that some of these mutants that I examined arose from clade 1 and clade 2 clones, it suggests that that earlier potentiating mutation also had epistatic effects. So to sum up, CIP plus was a major evolutionary innovation, the evolution of which was historically contingent, complex, and multi-step, occurring in three phases, a historically contingent process of potentiation that produced a genetic background within which the CIP plus uh, phenotype was mutationally accessible, followed by actualization in which chance mutation made the trait manifest, and then a process of refinement during which natural selection accumulated the mutations necessary to render the trait effective under the environmental conditions in which it evolved. My research indicates that potentiation involved at least two mutations. The second one, there's a candidate identified. You don't know the first one yet. You don't have any idea just yet. <coughs> Actualization involved, at the very least, the SIP duplication that produced an RNK CIT T regulatory module that led to expression of a citrate transporter during aerobic uh, conditions. But alternate actualizing mutations were possible that could have had multiple evolutionary effects. Refinement then involved two phases, the first of which uh, involved an increase in the module dosage of the regulatory module responsible for the phenotype and was putatively followed by a series of accumulations of later, more stable CIP plus refining mutations that are the subject of further study. So, in the future, I've got lots and lots and lots to do and thankfully 
Dr. Lewinsky is allowing me to stay on and be in the lab and continue working as a postdoc, so that's wonderful. I, I, it, I, I am so happy for that because there's so many more questions to ask. So certainly I want to continue to pursue and study those potentiating mutations and look at the refining mutations that occur after the population expansion. I mean, because after all, CIPLUS is a very good model for understanding how it is that genomes come to be accommodated to novel innovations. Then there's the question of the mystery of mysteries, speciation. Is CIPLUS a new species? E. coli is not supposed to be able to use citrate. This does. And it coexisted with CIP minus for a very long time. Are the mutations that were adaptive and refined CIP plus, are those detrimental in a CIP minus background? If they are, that would provide a barrier to gene exchange between the two lineages, and that would provide quasi fulfillment of the requirements of the biological species concept. That would be so cool to find out. Also, counterfactual experiments to carry out. Those 19 independent CIP plus mutants represent alternate ways that the evolution of CIP plus could have taken place. And they could have then altered the prospects for future uh, evolution of the population. And certainly, you know, maybe CIP minus couldn't have survived with CIP. That's going to be an interesting thing to look at, and I'm going to enjoy working with Caroline on that. So, on the broader picture, these three phases of CIP plus evolution are like to be broadly typical of other evolutionary innovations. These novel innovations likely require the prior occurrence of mutations that render them mutationally accessible to a lineage. And when they occur, they're most likely to be occurring in a very weak form. It's not, the genomes are not going to be ready for them. They're going to have to be refined. So, this three-step process is likely going to be seen in other innovations out there. And, interestingly, because potentiation is necessarily a process of contingency in history, this indicates that if potentiation is involved in the evolution of many innovations, then historical contingency has broad effect in evolution. So I think Stephen Jay Gould will be rather happy uh, with the results I've discussed today. Um, because I think on the broader level of contingency's role in evolution, the lessons of error minus could are these. First, natural selection is very good at constructing predictable adaptations from easily accessible variation. However, you need to win a little bit in order for, adapt for natural selection to work. And some innovations are not going to be easily constructed by readily available um, variations. There's not going to be much for natural selection to work with. This is really the new trait problem that Darwin himself struggled with and uh, Mitford beat him up on. And uh, you see evidence of this in chapter 7 of the 6th edition of The Origin. But, rare, happy, accidental historical sequences can make the needed variation accessible in an unpredictable manner. And this means that contingency arising from core evolutionary processes can lead to truly significant differences in new evolutionary trajectories. So, I would say that if one were to replay the tape of life many times, there would indeed be a great many similarities. There would also be occasional profound differences. So, in Gouldian tradition, I will end on an overly florid uh, end note and say, sometimes during the predictable climbing of Mount Improbable facilitated by natural selection, the odd lineage may chance to take a path less traveled by and find that unexpected, and that can make all the difference. <laughs> so, I want to thank DARPA, NSF, and Beacon for funding me, as well as a number of uh, fellowships and awards, particular to MMG, Natural Sciences, and EEBB. I want to thank RTSF, which is absolutely awesome for doing all of our sequencing and providing support. The people there are just wonderful. I want to thank Jeff for doing genomic analysis and wrangling the gnomes and helping keep down on light bulb bills because he provides his own illumination. Uh, I want to thank Chris Borland for doing the early work on CIP Plus and letting me rotate with her all those years ago. Uh, I got an email from her and she wished me luck and that was very nice. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Carla Davidson who really went through hell to do some expression experiments that I didn't have time to talk about, and has also been a really wonderful friend. Caroline, I want to thank you for your ecological research and being willing to put up with me in the future, so this is a preemptive thank you. Uh, I want to thank my wonderful committee members, uh, Dr.
Dr. Marsh, Dr. Afria, Dr. Pinnock, and Dr. Schmidt uh, for all of the help they've given me over the years and being patient with me these past few while I've been struggling to write and everything. I want to thank all the other members I haven't mentioned at the Linsky Lab. Uh, not only the support staff to keep us supplied, but also current members as well as the past members I've been able to work with and the many dozens and dozens who came before me. I want to thank Dr. Linsky, who's been the best uh, mentor I could possibly ask for. I mean, golly gee. This, <laughs> this man is a fantastic, he's a fantastic scientist. He is a fantastic human being. You are one of the best human beings I've ever met. Thank you so much for letting me study under you and being so supportive and helpful. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the Linsky field that Chris used to tell me about. That uh, apparently, brain function increases 20% within five feet of him. So <laughs> uh, that's where it all goes. <laughs> um, I also want to thank him for uh, being tolerant of certain eccentricities of mine, such as you know, uh, using grad school as a cover for art projects and you know sometimes participating in them himself. <laughs> that's been wonderful. Uh, I want to thank Brian Bear over there for all his technical support and friendship over the years and uh, uh, dealing with stupid questions. Like, Brian, what's this blue screen mean? And, uh, stuff like that and willing to loan me comic books and stuff for years on end. I'll get those back to you at some point. Uh, uh, I want to thank uh, members of my family, uh, my dear girlfriend, uh, Ray Broadway, uh, for all of their love and support over the years. I want to thank Marwa. Where are you, Marwa? Uh, there you are. Uh, I have Marwa up here under family because she was, for many years, uh, the foremost support uh, technician in the lab and she poured most of the media that went into those big plate towers. And during that time she was such a great help and I got to know her very well and she's really been the sister I never had. Marwa, I love you. Thank you so much. I want to thank the close friends who supported me and many others who, whether they know it or not, have brightened my days uh, while here. Uh, I want to thank all the teachers who got me here, especially my kindergarten teacher, Ms. Lisa, uh, uh, Ms. Watson, who really gave me a love of learning and of Mozart and corrected really horrible wounds from uh, first grade. Uh, my AP biology, Ms. Pugh, for suggesting that I go into biology. Uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Turnabini, who was my intro micro professor, who really got me interested in microbiology and it, it, it's led to wonderful things. Uh, my master's uh, advisor, Dennis Groban, who really um, was a great support during my first real research experience. And Dr. Miller, thank you so much for Nature and Practice of Science. Without a doubt, that was the greatest class I ever took as a grad student. And the work that I've done would not be nearly as good as it would be without you. And in fact, I went in to do the SIP Plus project because Chris put out a prospectus that listed a possible rotation project that showed signs of Platt's strong inference that you taught me to look for. So I am here because of you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Aristotle for <laughs> biology, otherwise I'd be a historian. I want to thank Charles Darwin for being just a fantastic role model as both a scientist and a human being. Stephen Jay Gould for his really nifty ideas and wonderful, if occasionally very frustrating writings. Um, I think, oh, wait, 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 there was one more. Uh, I want to thank Nirja Vizela, who is our lab manager, who kept me uh, supplied through all of these years, despite huge order requests. I have to admit, I was a little afraid of her when I came in. She seemed very forbidding and doer, but I soon found out how friendly and wonderful she is. And she has actually turned out to be one of the best friends I've ever had and a surrogate mother. I wouldn't have been able to make it through here without you.
So I think that's pretty much it, and so far so good, and I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Clade 3 with the clade 1 before citrate 
Oh, sure. Sure, in principle, yes. That's something that will be very interesting to do. You just haven't had a chance to do it yet. If there are no... Oh, there... I have yes. I'm not quite sure how to ask this. So I think what you've done is just stupendous. And I'm sitting here thinking about this idea that natural selection works on available genetic variation. And I wonder if you can tell me how what you're... Basically, what you've shown us is that there are particular mutations that are important for the evolution of this phenotype. I'm trying to make sense of that in the context of natural selection works on available genetic variation. How is what you're saying different from that? I think that, that there are levels of availability. Okay. Yeah. And history will make some potentially important variation more likely to occur than other variation. And that can have significant impact on future evolution. So it's the fact that there's a temporal sequence to the that is a big part of it, yes. Yeah, okay. yes. But that, that, that there is a gradation in levels of availability. There's a gradation in the levels of impact of different mutations in history and uh, a, 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 a non-fully non reticulated temporal sequence will have something to do with how evolution proceeds as a consequence. I guess I'm thinking about replaying the tape of life, right? So, <laughs> right. you replay the tape of life, I don't know, anyway. All right, if there are no further questions, let's thank Zachary.